In this video, we will guide you through step-by-step -step instructions for creating your own stock management database in Microsoft Access. We've also included some hints and tips based on our many years of experience creating stock management databases for real businesses. There is a free download of the database we'll be creating in this video available on our website. See the description below for the link. Note that in order to follow this tutorial or use the free sample, you must have a full version of Microsoft Access installed on your computer. In this video we'll be working in Access 2010, but the methods will be broadly the same in other versions, although in Access 2003 and older the interface will be significantly different. We'll also be assuming a passing familiarity with how Microsoft Access works. Step 1. Make a plan. It might sound obvious, but one of the most important points when creating any database is deciding exactly what you need it to do and what it's for. A well-designed database will be simpler to maintain and to adapt later on if your requirements alter. And getting the design right is much easier once you understand the purpose of the database. In this tutorial, we'll be using the example of a database managing supplies of parts. We want it to be able to perform three main tasks, log orders from customers, track our stock levels, and warn us when parts need to be reordered. There are other questions to ask yourself regarding the specifics of how your business works. Does each customer order one type of item at a time, or do your customers order a range of items from you all at the same time? Do you have just one supplier for each item you stock? Do you order a range of items from each supplier, or does each supplier just provide you with one type of item? Your design needs will also be different if you stock items for manufacturing rather than to sell on. Keep the answers to all of these questions in mind as we go through the next step. Step 2. Define the tables required. Information in a database is held in tables. By this point you should have some idea of the information the database needs to hold to achieve your goals. You need to categorise this information into a set of tables. To start with, you don't even need to do this in Access, just make a list by hand or in another program. Each table should deal with information related to just one area or subject. For example, a table for information on customers should contain no information on sales. But of course, data within one table is related to data in other tables using relationships that you define, allowing information on sales to particular customers to be accessed later on. The tables within our example database are Parts, Customers, Orders, Part Types, Purchase Orders and Suppliers. To keep things simple, we are going to assume that each customer orders just one part at a time and that we order just one part from a supplier at a time. Of course this might not be true for you. Your customers may order a whole selection of items together and you will probably buy a range of items from your suppliers in one go. In this case you'll need a table that holds all the parts needed for an order, probably called order items. We've made a similar sort of assumption about customers, assuming they're all individual people or small companies. For large business customers with multiple addresses or phone numbers to store, you would perhaps need a more advanced set of tables to hold all the information consistently. But all of this is a more advanced topic really, so we'll just show you the simple way for now using tables with more basic goals. Step 3. Invent fields within the tables. Within a table, information is held in fields. Basically, a field is the specific piece of information about the thing the table is responsible for. Typical fields in the parts table, for example, might be part number, part description, supplier and stock level. If you picture a table as a tabular grid, then the fields would be the column headings, with each row representing an entry in the table or record. All tables should have a unique identifying field called the primary key that cannot be the same for any two records or ever be empty. So, in our parts table, the part number is unique for each part, and every part has one, so we can use that. But for other tables where this may not be the case, we can invent ID numbers or codes for internal use in the system to make sure it can uniquely identify any entry in the table. 
In Access, there is something called an auto number field that you can use as the primary key if there's no other obvious choice or preference, which just assigns a new sequential number to each record in the table. For each field in the table, you need to pick a data type to show what type of data it will hold, such as a number, text, a date or time, or currency. Within each type, you can further specify the exact nature of the data, such as the number of characters for text. You might already use part numbers within your business, and the format you use is likely to help you decide the data type for the field's part number. Your part numbers might be something like this in which case you might choose to use an 8 character text string. Now we're going to imagine that our business deals with large numbers of different parts which we classify into different types. We have a table called Part Types which lists the different available types. We want to make our parts table have a field that can link to the list of part types allowing us to assign a predetermined type to each part. The field in the parts table needs to be the same as the primary key field, the thing that identifies the record to the system, in the part types table, which we've made a one character code. The parts table would also be related in a similar way to the suppliers table, so that you can find out who supplies a particular part. Think about how you will be using the fields and make sure you define them in the most logical way for your purposes. For example, it can make sense to store people's names as first name and surname separately rather than as one field, so that you can easily sort and list names in alphabetical order of surname or first name. A tip we find useful is to hold postal addresses as one field rather than split them into individual elements of the address, such as address line 1, line 2, town, county and postcode. This makes it much easier to incorporate addresses into forms and reports and it eases data entry because Access is happy to store the multiple lines of the address in one field. While thinking about what fields you need, you should make sure they all have unique names, unless two fields actually contain the same information. Only in this second case should you give them the same name, like with part type code earlier on. Something to keep in mind with your names is that if you want to progress to using SQL queries or Visual Basic for Applications code with your database, you'll find life easier if you have no spaces in the table names or field names. So that's why we've been writing part types as one word rather than having the space. Another tip to keep in mind is that it is bad practice to give a field a name that is already being used behind the scenes by Access for something else. These so-called reserved words include things like name, date, level, and money, among many others. You can look up a full list of Access's reserved words online to make sure none of your fields use one. This can help avoid confusion in the database engine between predefined words and your field names, which, if left unchecked, can sometimes cause serious errors. Step 4. Making the tables in Access now we know what we want to store, it is time to open up Access and make somewhere to store it. We'll show you how to make a table and its fields using our parts table from the sample database as an example. First, open up Access and create a new database. We're using the 2002-2003 file format .mdb. This will allow certain extra features for our database that can't be used in the newer ActDB format, which we shall detail later on. It will start with a table already open. Use the button in the top left to switch it to Design View, naming it Parts when prompted along the way. For the rest of your tables, you can open new tables in Design View via the Table Design button in the Create tab. In Design View, each row you see represents a field in the table. Start in the first row by entering the first field name, which for us is Part No. Press Tab to move into the Data Type column, which for us is going to be a 10 character text string, so for now we pick Text. Now we can tab into the next column and add an optional description of the field, which will appear in Access's status bar in the bottom left when the field is used in the future, so it's good to provide a reminder of what is meant to be entered. This part no is going to be the primary key for this table, so we need to click on the key icon in the ribbon to establish this. Now we can get into the field's properties at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to set the size of my text field to 10 characters since that is the maximum size I want to allow. I can also add a caption that can have the field name but using spaces, part, no. 
This is what will actually appear to the user when using the table later, so you should give everything a caption to help describe the field if the actual field name doesn't make it clear enough. So that's all for the first field. Now I can go through adding all the fields I've planned, then save the table once I've got everything from my design set up. When there are multiple fields that will be the same thing and hence should have the same name in your design as mentioned earlier, make sure they have the same data type and size in all cases, as this will make setting up relationships a little easier later on. Once you've got one table set up, you can go through the rest of your plan tables, setting them all up too. You'll see your new tables appearing in the object browser on the left as you make them. Step 5. Set up relationships. Relationships are set up within the database to show the way in which one table relates to another. A so-called one-to-many relationship is the most common kind. In this relationship, a record in one table can have more than one matching record in a second table, but for each record in the second table, there can only be one matching record in the first table. For example, each part can only have one part type, but for each part type, it's likely that there will be many parts of that type. If each part has only one supplier, as in our example, then this is another straightforward one-to-many relationship. In our database, the following relationships between tables are required. Suppliers relates to parts, so as to specify the supplier of each part. Parts relates to purchase orders, to show the part ordered on a purchase order. Parts relates to orders, to show the part ordered on an order. Customers relate to orders, to show the customer for each order and part types relates to parts since we're classifying each part into a particular part type. As an example, we'll show you how to set up the relationship between the table's parts and part types. Before you start doing relationships, it's a good idea to write some sample information into your tables that feature entries which are as long as you think you'll ever use. This will help out a little with some things you'll need to adjust later on. First, make sure you have set up the field part type code in the part types table as a single character text string, and that this field is the primary key. Now open the parts table in design view. If you haven't already, add a field part type code to the parts table and make sure it is also a single character text string. Now in the data type column of this part type field, click on lookup wizard. Select I want the lookup column to look up the values in a table or query, since we'll be looking at values in the part types table, then click next. From the list of tables displayed, select the part types table and click next again. On this screen you pick the fields you want included in your lookup column. If you pick more than one thing it still means only one piece of information will be stored in the field, but other information will be shown while you are picking it. In this case we'll select both fields, we're going to store the code while showing the full type name to help people pick the right one. Click next to continue to a sort order screen. For us, only the actual type description is going to be visible, so we'll sort by that. The next step allows you to define the width of the columns in your lookup column and to specify whether you wish the key column, the column containing the primary field key, to be displayed. By default, the key column is not displayed and in our case we just want to view the description, so leave the tick in the box. Now set the width of your lookup column by dragging the edge to the position you require. If you've already entered some data into the parts types table as we suggested earlier, this will be displayed to help you adjust the column to the width of the likely contents. Once you've chosen a width, click next. Now select the name for your lookup column. You'll want to call it by the information actually being stored in there rather than what is displayed, so here I'll leave it as part type code. Click finish to complete the lookup wizard. You'll be asked if you want to save the table so that relationships can be created, go ahead and do that. There is actually one more thing to do though. Select tools in the ribbon, then relationships, or click the relationships button on the toolbar to display the relationships window. You will see the parts table and the part types table with a line linking the part type code field in parts with the part type code field in part types. If you don't, use the add tables button to get both of these tables into the diagram. Right click this line and choose edit relationship or double click on the line. In the pop-up that appears, tick the enforce referential integrity box. 
you should almost always tick this, as otherwise the relationship has little value. For example, if you have defined three different part types in the parts table, E electronics, S software, H hardware, ticking the enforced referential integrity box will ensure that you will not be able to define a new part as any part type other than these. Also, if you try to delete a part type that has been assigned to a part already, and hence is in use by the parts table, the database will warn you. You'll also want to tick the Cascade Update Related Fields box. This means that you can change the primary key in the primary table, which is the part types table here, and it will automatically be updated in the related table, the parts table here. The third box is Cascade Delete Related Records. Ticking this means that if you delete a record, e.g. S for software, from the primary table, then any records in the related table, the parts, with that part type will be deleted too. Normally you would not want this to happen, so leave the box unticked. There will probably be examples in your database where you do want to tick the Cascade Delete Related Records box. It normally applies when one table forms supplementary information for another. For example, if you had orders and order items listing multiple items on an order, then you would want to delete order items if you deleted an order. So now you've seen how to set up a relationship, you should go through the table setting up the relationships you had planned in your design. Once you've done them all, we can move on to the final part of our database. Step 6. Create a reorder query. In general, queries are used to extract data and information from your database. In our example, we want to know whether we have less than the minimum stock level for any parts, so that we know when we need to reorder more. You can extract all sorts of other information with queries too. You might want to know all the parts supplied by a particular supplier, or how often a particular customer ordered last year. Often you will extract the information using a query and then use an access report to present the data in a clear way, but here we'll just be doing the query. So now let's go through how to set up a query to show which parts are below their minimum stock level and tell us the suppliers from whom they should be reordered. In the Create tab, click Query Design. We need to choose which tables we want to query information from. In this case we know that we'll need information on the stock level of parts, which is in the Parts table, and details of the supplier for those parts, which is in the Suppliers table. Adding these tables to the query is easy. In the Show Table box, select Parts. Click Add to include that table in our query. Select Suppliers and do the same. The Query Design grid is now displayed with the chosen tables above. Fields to be included in the query are added by dragging them from the table to the grid, or double-clicking on them in the tables. We only need to include fields that contain the information we want to output in our query. So let's say we want our query to be a list of part numbers with their stock level plus the supplier the part is from and the address for that supplier. The fields we require are part number, stock level from the parts table, supplier name and the address from the suppliers table, so select all of these. You'll see them appear in our query at the bottom. Now we only want to display parts whose stock level is less than the minimum stock level for this part. This is done by setting a criterion for this field. Enter less than or equal to min stock level in the criteria row of the stock level field. Now the query will only display rows where this is true. Since I'm not actually going to be displaying the minimum stock level, I don't need to add it to the query fields. It just needs to be somewhere in the tables that are the data source for my query. Click the X in the top right hand corner of the window to close the query. Access will ask you if you want to save your changes and will ask you for a name for the query. I'll call mine Low Stock Levels. Again having no spaces in the name can help later if developing the database further. The query should be visible in the object browser on the left. Double click on the query to view the parts with low stock levels once you have some working data in the system. One last thing about the query. The lines between the tables in your query dataset are called joins. Joins are automatically created between tables when there are fields that already have a relationship between them, or between a primary key and another field with the same name. 
Usually you would want to join here, but there will be cases where you don't want to join these fields for various reasons, so keep in mind that you may need to check all the joins once they are created. Join properties in queries are very important when your query uses more than one table. If the query does not seem to give you the results you expect, check these by right-clicking on the line joining the two tables in Design View. Here you can choose whether you want to see only parts that have a supplier or all parts with low stock, regardless of whether they have a supplier. Include all records from parts and only those records from suppliers where the joined fields are equal. You may wish to go for this in this case. The third option is the reverse of this, so show all suppliers even if they don't supply any low stock parts, which in this case wouldn't make any sense, so just ignore that one. So now we have completed the database as per our design. We can enter all the data we need and it will tell us when to reorder products. Of course the potential uses of a database are many, so now we're going to discuss briefly a few ways you might want to expand on this database to make it more useful and more user friendly. Forms In Access you use forms to view, enter and edit data and to control the database. When you've set up all the tables and relationships in your database, the form wizard is a very helpful tool in setting up forms based on your tables for data entry, viewing and editing the data. You can then make changes to the form produced by the form wizard, adding and editing features as required. Forms can also be used to display buttons and links to provide access to all the other forms and reports. This allows you to build a user interface for your system. We always set up a form of this type and call it the front screen. Setting up a clear top level form like this makes it easy for people to use the system with no database knowledge. Here are a few examples of complex forms used in our commercial databases. Reports Microsoft Access reports allow you to display information to the user in a convenient way which can be viewed on screen and then printed if required. Normally the information for the report will come from a query. The report wizard will help you create simple reports for a variety of purposes. An example of a useful report in our database could be a purchase order document to send to suppliers with details of an order. Detailed reports like this are beyond the scope of this video, but are certainly something to look into if you want to bring the data from your database back into the real world in a presentable form. Security You might want to make sure that no one who isn't trusted can tamper with your data. The simplest way of doing this is to protect the database with a password. To set or change the password, the database must be opened for exclusive use. To do this, Open up Access, then use File and Open to select the database. Click the arrow box on the right of the Open button and select Open Exclusive. Once opened, go to the File menu again and then select the Info sub-menu and click on Set Database Password. Enter the password you require and re-enter to verify. The password is now set. When creating a large stock control database or one that holds sensitive information, you may require more complex security. For example, you might want to restrict access to some of the information in the database, or you might want to let some users view the information in the database but not be able to change it. If you followed our example from the beginning and saved your database as a .mdb file rather than the newer ActDB format, Access allows you to define types of user and apply levels of security so that you can specify what actions are available to each type of user. This is again beyond the scope of this video, but it's called user level security if you want to look for more information. Automation Access allows you to write custom code in its Visual Basic for Applications language, known as VBA. You can set up a piece of code to run when you perform certain actions or just on command. This enables you to automate many processes. For example, you might want your system to adjust your recorded stock levels automatically whenever a delivery is received, or you might want the customer reference field to be built automatically from the surname of the customer. 
Using VBA to automate features can make using an access database much easier and simpler for its users, but it does require programming knowledge, so it's a more advanced step to take in your database's development. So that's all for this tutorial. Hopefully it will have helped you set up your simple database ready to start putting it to use. The database we've shown you how to make is probably too basic to use for long even for a small operation. This system is a building block upon which many more tables, relationships and user interfaces can be laid to construct a complete piece of stock management software. Of course, if you've decided that building your own stock control database is not for you after all, we at Software Matters are happy to give advice about alternatives via our free consultation offer. Contact us on 01747 822616 or fill in an inquiry form on our website linked in the video description and we'll get back to you. Otherwise, we wish you the best of luck using and maybe further improving your new stock control database. If you want more Excel, Access and VBA tips, then subscribe to this channel and if you found this video helpful, please leave a like or a comment to let us know. Thanks for watching.